I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and we've got a great show set up for you today across the table from me, senior ballistician Jaden Quinton. Jaden, thanks for coming on. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I guess uh, I stumbled over your last name there because in my head I was thinking Quinlan's Corner. I knew you were going to say yeah, that. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so in this installment of Quinlan's Corner, um, you know, over the last several, well, it's been months now, mm-hmm. but we've, we've really gone through everything from the early history of studying ballistics, you know, I shoot something, why does it do what it does? Mm -hmm. We've gone all the way up to present day right now. And along the way, we've kind of bashed on some things and bashed is probably not the right term, but we've certainly shed light to what is the inherent deficiencies in the, you know, generally accepted way of calculating a ballistic solution. Mm -hmm. And there are inherent deficiencies and you can you know, squish that up any way you want to and bend it here and move it here and fudge it here and tweak this and you can get it better, Mm -hmm. but those are still deficiencies. And so, um, the senior ballistic scientist at the time, David and Emery and you, uh, along with the help of some supporting cast designed the Ford off ballistic solver. Now this is the answer to those inherent deficiencies that we've been talking about previous. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with ballistic coefficient and what's wrong with using it? Ford off solves those. And Hornady Fordoff, I guess, solves those. But beyond that, the modified point mass solvers are the answer because they use the actual drag of your actual projectile. And they account for the fact that your bullet has certain design attributes and it is a spinning object in the, in the world right. versus the BC just assuming everything is a lump object. Um, so yeah. let's get into, first off, why you guys decided to do this mm-hmm. and what makes using a modified point mass solver different than a ballistic coefficient solver? And what does that mean for us as shooters? Sure. Yeah. Uh, great questions. So to, to start off, why did we do it? Um, when we got our Doppler radar, we finally had a piece of equipment that was capable of measuring the things required to do the really advanced calculations, that CD versus mock curve, for mm-hmm. example. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that opened the door to possibility, the Doppler radar did. So this would have been in 2013, 14 timeframe. Now, the other thing that we really took a hard look at, as we said, with, with BC-based calculations, like we've talked about in the last couple podcasts, they work. They work really well in some circumstances, and in others, they don't. But sure. in general, they work, and they have worked for a very long time. Yeah, they've worked good enough. Good enough, yeah. Yeah, great way to put it. Um, but from our perspective, you know, we're, we're a projectile and ammunition manufacturing company, mm-hmm. and we spend a ton of time and money and resources in devel- into developing what we believe are the best products in the world. Um, so no matter how much time and, and sweat and tears and money we put into, say, a bullet design, let's say A-tip, you know, our, the most recent Premier. pinnacle of performance, right. um, no matter how much time and work we put into that bullet, if you miss your target... Does it matter? Does it matter if you were shooting a, a bargain bin FMJ or a 250 A tip? You miss, you missed, a miss yeah. is a miss, right? right. It's, what you missed with is kind of irrelevant at that point. Um, so there was, there was a piece missing from our, call it products as a whole, and that was a better ballistic solution to use our products. Um, so what we what we took a hard look at, as we said, BC is pretty good. I mean, we went through the details of all that on the last podcast, but there was there was still some pieces missing, and we could make that better. And so we talked and decided, you know, let's let's put the money and time into developing the ability to bring these better ballistic solutions to everybody out there. It shouldn't be limited. There shouldn't be a massive you know cost thing to it. Right. Um, that's another thing we did is we offered it for free, and still we still do. Still do. And, and uh, we had a lot of conversations about that. Should we charge for it? Should we not? Because we put a ton of money into developing this thing over the years. Um, but we felt as though, no, we, we shouldn't put a cost to it because you're purchasing our product. You're purchasing our bullet or our ammunition. That's really what we run off of, right? That's the meat and potatoes of our business. Right. So giving you a tool to use those better shouldn't cost you again, you know? So that, that was the reason why it was free. Um, 
another conversation we had early on, and we'll get into a little bit here, was do we just do our bullets or do we do other people's bullets too? Sure. And, you know, as you'll see, and as users know, we have many other competitor bullets in there as well. And the thought there was other people make good bullets too. And just because you shoot one of their bullets doesn't mean you shouldn't be allowed to have these super advanced calculations. But maybe if you shoot somebody else's bullet, maybe by chance, you know, when you're playing with the calculator, you'll look at that bullet that you're shooting from somebody else. And maybe you'll go look at the Hornady equivalent of that and say, wow, it, it's a little better or it's about yeah. the same. Maybe I'll try it. You know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll give reason to, to try some more of our products. So that was kind of the, the initial stages of it. Okay. Um, development wise, it took quite a while to do. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty advanced. Now, uh, as you see on the screen here, we're going to have a segregation bes between like BC based comparisons and then, and then the Ford off, which is a modified point mass, um, solver. Some, some listeners out there will recognize that term modified point mass. Those, uh, those programs have been available, um, prior to our launching of, of the Hornady Ford off, but they're, they demand a lot of information mm -hmm. to use them. Sure. So like a BC based calculator is a pretty simple calculator and the inputs required by the user are pretty simple. With a Ford offer, a modified point mass program, you have to have a ton of inputs and those inputs are not known or available to the user. And so there's a big barrier of entry there on being able to use this technology in that the users don't have access to what they need to run it. So what we did is we took, we put that on upon ourselves. We have the ability to generate all those numbers that you need here. And we could put all that into a package where all you have to do is pick your bullet and we did all the work for you. Excellent. So we'll, we'll get into kind of the meat and potatoes of that. So from a basic, uh, <clears throat> basic comparison standpoint, first, let's talk about um, the point mass solvers, the BC based programs, kind of generalized terms there that are, that are uh, equal. So what we have is um, predictions in three degrees, three degrees of freedom, you'd call it. So you have elevation, up, down, windage, left, right, and then range. You know, How far down away downrange. Down okay. So those are the three axes that the, the solver is giving you an output for. And, and we're pretty familiar with that. So what happens when you go to a Ford offer, a four degrees of freedom? Well, you get this fourth dimension here. Well, first you get the first three, same three, elevation, windage, and range. But you also get angle of attack, which is, we're going to find out here, incredibly important for getting the most accurate predictions possible. Now, you can't have angle of attack without having a bullet in there. There's, a, there's all kinds of intricacies about the bullet that we're going to go through. All of that stuff is required to be able to do that angle of attack calculation. So at a baseline level, the difference between the Hornady Ford off and the BC based programs available is that the Hornady Ford off has a bullet in it and it's predicting the angle of that bullet relative to the, the flight path that it's yep. on. And it's not just a generic bullet. It is the specific bullet that you are actually shooting. That's right. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we added this angle of attack thing in there. Why is that important? For a couple different reasons. Um, the, the dynamic behavior of a bullet, so if it's wobbling around or it's flying perfectly straight or whatever that bullet is doing in flight, it affects how fast it slows down. And if you remember back to some of those really early podcasts on kind of the fundamentals of ballistics as we went through them, how fast a bullet slows down is the most important question. That tells yeah. us how long is it exposed to gravity? How long is it exposed to wind? All those type of things that we're concerned about in getting a good, accurate ballistic solution is tied to that time again. How fast does it slow down? So the bullet dynamics part of it, if we look at this graph here, um, and again, for the listener, we'll try to, try to describe this well. Um, what we have is if you took like a Sharpie marker and attached it to the bullet's nose mm -hmm. and you fired it and you let it draw its nose patterning out, this would be a representation of that. So... It's starting right here where my little marker is. And that nose pattern is, you know, kind of going around like a spirograph until it finally settles down over here. Most people have heard the term bullet goes to sleep. That's kind of what that graph represents. Yep. Big portions of yaw initially, and then it slowly dampens out. Yep. And it dampens out to the right. That's back to that spin drift thing we talked about yep. in earlier podcasts. But the fact that that's occurring, the bullet nose is never perfectly at zero and zero means that those dynamic behaviors are going to have an impact on your trajectory, on where the bullet ends up going. Aerodynamic jump. Uh, you, to, to correctly account for aerodynamic jump, which is the, the, the vertical jump that occurs due to a crosswind component, um, you have to have the angle of attack. You, you 
you can't calculate it without that. Right. Um, spin drift, same thing. You know, we see the example here where as that bullet continues downrange, its nose points more and more and more to the right. You can't calculate spin drift without an angle of attack. Now, you can estimate these things, which we'll get to here in a little bit, but you can't calculate it. And there's a difference there. Sure there is. Dynamic instability. We talked a little bit about that on one of the podcasts. Why does a bullet um, dramatically pick up angle of attack at certain points in its flight? And in some circumstances, your point of impacts can become really erratic. That also is tied to angle of attack. You, you have To be able to, to figure out what each of those things do, you have to have angle of attack. So it's very important. So with that said, we'll kind of go through the process of, of what the Ford off is made of, and then we'll continue on with the comparison to BC. So to okay. start out, we have what's called a Ford off bullet model. So when you pick up a, a bullet out of the database, this is kind of what's happening under the hood. So the first thing we do is we take the bullet that we're, that we're going to be using, and we fire that thing with the Doppler radar. And what we're measuring with that, obviously, is the drag. That's where we get that CD versus Mach number from. And you see that there in that image. That's the you know, the screenshot of the radar. Yeah, that's so the raw, just, just track the bullet downrange. Yep, that's velocity versus time. Yep. Once that part's done, we've measured the drag of the bullet in its entire flight path through all kinds of different barrels and guns and loads and stuff like that. The next step is to correctly model the bullet and, and its shapes and its layouts. So what we do is we take a bullet and we measure all of the outside dimensions of it. What are the boat tail dimensions? What are the bearing surface dimensions? What are the ogive and tip dimensions? Me yeah. plat, all, all that stuff Diameters, gets measured. radius, length. Exactly, yep. And then we cut that bullet in half, and then we measure the insides of all that. Once we do that, <clears throat> we build a, essentially a software model of what those bullets' measurements were, and then we assign uh, the different densities that are correlated to those materials. So copper jacket, lead core, polymer tip, aluminum tip, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And we, we then have a software model that from that we can, we can pull out all of the inertia properties of the bullet, what are its inertial tendencies, as well as the exact center of gravity location. And we talked about center of gravity a little bit in those older podcasts as well. So that's kind of step two. Step one, fire it over the radar. Step two, generate the model. Step three is to take that model and we run it through what's called a, a spark range database. So the spark range is pretty interesting. Um, they're primarily owned by the government because they're extremely expensive. Uh, and this is a picture you can see here. So what happens with a spark range is a bullet is fired down through these little squares here. Up above the square at, at somewhat of an angle, say a 45 degree angle is a mirror. And then uh, back behind uh, is a witness pane and down at the bottom is a witness pane. And then over to the left is a is a like a flash x-ray type system. Okay. When the bullet passes through that screen, it's kind of like a chronograph. It triggers uh, this flash x-ray to go off. That x-ray comes up, it hits this mirror and bounces down. And then it also comes straight across the bullet. And what it does is it essentially records an image from the side, takes a picture from the side of the bullet, and then it takes a picture from the top of the bullet. And so what you can do, and it does that, what, you know, like every two yards? Yeah, every for five, quite six a while. feet, something like that. So what, what, the, what the government has done is they take bullets and they fire them through that range and they they will perturb them or disturb them in certain ways they'll they'll make them the the back end of the bullet kick up and the nose kick down and then they'll watch how it responds to that and how it behaves and you can see in this bullet here this um would be an example of a result you would get from that but you see those two pins in the base mm -hmm. so those two pins are used to assess the roll orientation of the bullet it's okay. rotation so from this, this spark range, you can record the bullet's position in six different degrees of freedom, which is the six ways a bullet can move. Um, and essentially what happens is the government's done all that work. They have this huge database of projectiles, and we take our specific projectile and its model, and it gets ran through that database. And it says how many bullets are similar enough in the database to this bullet that we're looking at that we can use all of its dynamic behaviors to use the aerodynamic moments and coefficients tied to that bullet. Those aerodynamic moments and coefficients are what calculates its dynamic response to a certain, you know, set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So those dynamics we were talking about is what's being recorded in this in this range. Wow. 
that then generates this table here. And this table is, again, the, the table of aerodynamic moments and coefficients. So some of them, maybe the really advanced listeners have heard of, say, the pitching moment coefficient or, or pitch damping or where the normal force center pressure is, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's what this table uh, wow. is a recording of. Okay. Wow. So, so there's one, a few numbers there. Yeah. So once we have those things, those all get brought together into the Hornady Ford off bullet file. So that's the Doppler radar drag curves. That's all of the aerodynamic moments, coefficients, inertial properties, and mass properties of that bullet. And those all get paired together. And you see here, when you when you load uh, a, a bullet from the Ford off library and, and, and you select it, what happens in the background is this is the file that's selected and used for calculations of that. There's 437 unique values in every Ford off bullet file specific to that one bullet. That's remarkable. That's pretty cool, especially when you compare it to what happens on the BC side. On the BC side, sometimes the program only knows one thing about your bullet. There's BC-based programs out there that will calculate just based on a BC. There's uh, mo Most of them will have a BC input, a bullet weight, and a bullet diameter input. That's three things. Mm -hmm. So that program knows three things about your bullet versus 437 things about your bullet. And in some circumstances, there's programs that use bullet length. That why, that's why it has an asterisk. It's not quite as common. Um, but even then, four things, four things versus 437 things. It's and even if you had four different BC values where you could put different BCs at different Mach values, that's still eight things versus 437 things that are unique to your individual bullet. That's right. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge leap in, in you know, definition yeah. uh, of well, the, what you're doing. It's clear that the computational power of the Fordoff calculator is vastly more complex than a simple BC based calculator. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Is yeah. It? If it wasn't for our modern technology and computational power, we couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. It would, it would be too much. Yeah. Before you get uh, down on the next path, one thing I wanted to call out specifically, cause I get this question quite a bit. And I know you have as well. When you grab a bullet out of Fordoff, you click, okay, I'm going to shoot the 108 grain ELD match and you click it and it uploads the drag profile. You, I know you'll get into this later, but to get the, profile in there mm -hmm. we've shot that through usually at least half of a dozen six or more different configurations different barrel manufacturers barrel twists muzzle devices different propellants mm -hmm. uh everything that can affect the drag we've shot it through six to twelve different combinations of that and then put in the average drag yes uh, to try to account for everything because those little things like different propellants that most people don't appreciate have an effect on your drag might be minor, half a percent, one percent, whatever it is. We put in an average, and we shoot these things through a bunch of different, mm -hmm. uh, a bunch of different combinations to get the most accurate average that we can. Um, I just wanted to call that out because some folks think like, well, of course you're going to shoot it through a hyper fast twist rate at Mach three mm -hmm. and put that in there because that make you know means the drag is the lowest or the highest, but you're going to have the flat trajectory and you're going to have the high BCs. That's how you got to do it. And it's like, no, that's not what we do at all. Yeah, not at all. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, we try to, we try to test it in the most, uh, encom encompassing envelope we can in how it's going to get used. Exactly. You know, and, and that's kind of the goal. So, um, so let's talk about a little bit of specific stuff. So how do these programs handle gyroscopic stability? Gyroscopic stability is really important. I mean, that defines whether your bullet's going to be flying point forward or it's going to be completely unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And we, we discussed this in, in detail in, in the earlier podcasts. But if we remember back to those, um, the, the center of gravity is, is defined by um, the center of pressure and the center of gravity locations and, and their relationship to each other. Well, that center of gravity location is defined by the mass layout within the shape. What is that bullet made out of? And what is the shape of it? And that will dictate where the center of gravity is. Well, you saw that when we built that model, I mean, we laid all that out. We, we specifically calculated exactly where the center of gravity was. Mm -hmm. Well, the center of pressure is defined by a couple things. Like we said in that podcast, um, the shape, the more aerodynamic the shape is, the more further forward that uh, center of pressure will move. The air density that it's flying through, uh, the more dense the air is, the more to the rear it's going to move. The velocity it's flying at, the more velocity, the more to the rear the center of pressure will move, and that the relationship between center of pressure and center of gravity defined the stability stuff. There's there's already a lot there, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, then when you go, if you were to go into the formula that calculates gyroscopic stability, you have to have the inertias, you have to have the spin rate, which that's not crazy hard, right? I mean, that's velocity yeah. and twist rate. Uh, you have to have the air density. You have to have the diameter of the bullet. You have to have the velocity it's traveling at, and you have to have the pitching moment coefficient. So where, there's a couple of those that you're, there's not a snowball's chance in hell you're going to find as yeah. a normal guy. Where are you going to get that information? Yeah. Right. This is some of that limitation that, on, on why uh, this is kind of groundbreaking in its application to everybody. Everybody has access to this now. Right. So if we look at um, you know, gyroscopic stability, spin drift, and aerodynamic jump, all of those things are kind of tied to what we just looked at there in, in gyro. So the BC-based uh, ballistics calculators, if they do give you an output for gyroscopic stability or spin drift or aerodynamic jump, they're doing it based off of a empirical formula that they've developed based on testing, right? You go out and you shoot a whole bunch at a thousand yards and you determine that this amount of spin drift exists and you make a formula that calculates that, right? It's, yeah. it's based so off it's, empirical testing. Yeah, yeah, you can test it and you can make it probably work pretty well, but it's still not factual. It's just a empirical formula. Right. It, it's a way to get to a number. Yep. But each bullet has different spin drift in different circumstances. So the only way to get the right answer is to calculate it by how it actually works, mm -hmm. which requires all that information. So if you look, um, you know, the Miller stability formula is, is commonly used um, as the basis to most of these BC-based calculations of spin drift and aerody aerodynamic jump. And what the, what the formula takes into account is bullet length. That's why I said that on that other slide with the asterisk. Bullet diameter, bullet weight, and twist rate. Well, that's a far cry from what we just looked yeah, at on center yeah. of gravity, center inertias, of pressure. Inertias, absolutely. Pitching, pitching moment, moment coefficient. So... What Fordoff does when it calculates gyroscopic stability, spin drift, or aerodynamic jump, it takes that bullet model, the inertial properties, the mass properties, the spin rate, the diameter, the pitching moment, and the velocity, and it calculates those in the equation that solves for gyroscopic stability. So, totally different, right? Yeah. Well, and just, you know, you look at the Miller stability formula, their rule of thumb was, oh, you want, you know, 1.4 uh, on the Miller stability formula. That way, there was some fudge factor. Right. Well, you don't have to have fudge factor if you actually solve the equation appropriately right right um and some folks will say well well spin drift's a pretty small value uh aerodynamic jump is kind of a small value so if those numbers are off a little bit you know, well, i'm not too worried about it but again back to those earlier podcasts do small errors matter they certainly do mm -hmm. right because you're talking about a distribution a, a level of dispersion and a patterning that if you shift that just a little bit off of where you should be. It has a pretty big percentage impact on what you're capable of. Exactly. So those, those things do matter. Um, kind of uh, a little bit of an unusable point, but one to prove the point. Um, the the Fordoff calculator will correctly model an unstable bullet in how fast it slows down. So that would kind of prove to you that, you know, if I take a, I take a 108 ELD match, like you were given an example of, and I shoot it out of a factory 243 Winchester, that bullet's not stable. The right. twist rate of that is not going to stabilize the bullet. And so that thing's going to come out and it's going to pick up an immense amount of angle of attack, which is going to make it slow down incredibly fast. And at some point it's going to snap back to once it's slowed down so fast that it now is gyroscopically stable. And then it's going to continue on that way. Um, if you, if we take the radar and we shoot that circumstance, a 108 with a 243, and we see how, you know, how fast does that bullet lose velocity? And then we, we put those same conditions into the Fordoff solver and we execute it, you get the same numbers. Wow. So that just proves to you that it's doing things right, not only the way you want it to from a stable bullet perspective, but it's accurate enough that it can predict the, the, the negative acceleration rate of a bullet that is unstable. Wow. That, that's really cool from that a technical really standpoint. Okay, uh, here's one where we talk about environmental conditions. So... Both uh, BC-based codes and Fordoff require temperature. We went through quite the tirade on temperature oh, and how important that is. Yeah, especially when you're using a BC, it is dependent exactly. on that temperature. Exactly. Uh, we also input pressure on both systems. We also input humidity on both systems. And then altitude, I have an asterisk under the BC side, but no asterisk under the Fordoff side. The reason that I have altitude with an asterisk under the BC side is because most BC-based programs consider 
bullet flight to be flat fire, so that's less than 15 degrees. Okay. So they they the assumption is that the air density is not going to change greatly across the bullet's trajectory. And in many cases, that's true. But in some cases, it's not. Sure. If you're going to shoot high angles of fire over long range, that bullet is either increasing or decreasing in, del- in altitude in significant ways. Sure. And so what we do in Fordoff is when you put in a temperature, pressure, humidity, and altitude, let's just say we tell it we're at 1,312 feet, that it's 54 degrees out, and 966 uh, millibar, and convert that to inches yeah. HG, um, we tell it that those are the conditions at that point. What it has is an earth reference frame in it. This isn't just gun bullet connection, you know, okay. reference frame. It has an earth based reference frame in it. And what it says is, okay, if you tell me that the temperature is 54 degrees and the pressure is this and the humidity is this at this altitude, those things change at a pretty constant rate when you go up or down in altitude. Mm-hmm. So what it then builds is an earth based table from negative 600 feet up to, I believe we're at 15,000 feet is the top end of that table. Um, and you can see the temperature's changing, right? Yeah. At 1312, it's 54 degrees. At 2400 foot, it's 50 degrees. That's a four degree change. What happened when we started playing with temperature? What did it do to Mach number? Well, it changed the Mach number and it changed the drag on the bullet. Yep. It moved the Mach number and therefore you're working at a different point in bullet drag and in all those aerodynamic moments and coefficients we talked about in that table, all of those are tied to a Mach number. So when you shoot at really steep uphill or downhill angles, the bullet is flying through different temperature regimes and pressure and mm-hmm. humidity. And without that table in there to calculate it, you're, you're leaving that on the table. That's going to yeah. be error that you have to deal with. Is it small? Probably. But I suppose at the more severe the angle and the further the shot distance, and it's not uncommon for mountain hunters now with the equipment to make shots, you know, four, five, six hundred yards at 20 degrees at an uphill or downhill angle or more than that. And in shot, shot situations like that, not changing that or not, not that you'd have the ability to, but not accounting for that is leaving, like you said, it leaves it on the table. Yep. It's a variable that you can't control. And uh, yeah, we should try to minimize those. Right. And, and folks will argue, you know, oh, well, it doesn't really change that much. You're, you're right. It doesn't change that much over a couple hundred yards. It changes quite a bit when you're talking thousands of yards at steep angles. Mm-hmm. But the point is that those small little errors get additive, right? You have sure. a little error here, a little error here, a little error here. And you're willing to accept each of those errors because in isolation, they're very small and not worth, you know, your concern. However, those can add up to big problems on your your solution. That's the point of all this. Mm-hmm. So how do we account for drag variables? Well, with BC-based systems, um, you typically, uh, you true the BC to the point of impact, yeah. right? We went- Standard. I mean, that is everybody out there that's got a Kestrel or any other BC-based calculator, they're true in the BC. Right. And you see it at all the matches. Right. And we, we went into detail on the last podcasts about you know, this can compound the mismatch in drag curve shape, right? That was the root of that whole problem is the drag curve shape of the G7 or the G1 isn't matching what your bullet is and all those issues. Um, so there's, there's the stuff we went through when we calculated BC stuff. Now we know drag changes uh, depending on um, certain details, right? Like yeah. a barrel twist rate or barrel rifling form or yeah. a muzzle device or all these little things can have a small impact on the bullet drag. And so we have a thing in the Fordoff called Axial Form Factor. And what that is, is the adjustment tool. Just like you said, we put in the average in there of all of our testing. But your specific gun may not be on the average. You know, you may be on the lower drag side of the average or the upper drag side of it. And so we put in a system in there where you can adjust to that. Essentially tune um, your bullet coming out of your rifle to the drag that it's exhibiting. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's a percentage shift higher or lower. So you can see here in this graph, uh, the black line would be the average curve that we put in. And then the red line would be down 10% and the blue line is up 10%. And we stop you there. Yeah. That's really important. We, yeah, that is really important. The reason that that's so important is because on the BC based programs, if you're truing muzzle velocity or you're truing BC or you're truing drag in whatever, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. form it is based on the program you're using. There's generally no limitation to that. And what I mean by that is you can have something else completely wrong 
let's say your zero's off and you don't think it is. So you're proceeding on to shoot and you're out at distance and you're hitting really, really high, higher than you ever could be from a drag problem, right. but you don't know that. And so what, what happens all too often is somebody says, oh, well, it's the BC that's wrong and they adjust it yeah. way out of whack. I mean, yeah. it's, it's literally impossible for that bullet to have that BC. But there's no limitations to stop you there. And you have to be a pretty savvy you know, user to understand when a BC becomes ridiculous, yeah. right? And so that leaves a problem. You're allowed to adjust things any which way you want. And before long, you're, you're way out of whack and you're way off. So one of the problems is there's no limitation on those other programs. Some programs require you to calibrate at, at long to extremely long distances where other things become problematic. So at those really long distances, um, there's other variables that are coming into play besides drag. You're trying to say that my drag is off, right? You're either adjusting your drag or your BC or whatever it is. You're, you're making the claim that that's where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of other things happening. Um, velocity and drag variation are playing into where you hit. Aiming error is playing into it. Recoil management, the raw dispersion, your raw group size, all that stuff is playing into why those bullets go where they go. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, no, nope, all those things, I know exactly what they are and they're not contributing that it's my bullet drag that's the problem. Well, that's an issue because it's probably not true. So if we look at an example here, you know, this is at Mach 0.9. There's some programs out there that they won't let you adjust the drag until you shoot at Mach 0.9. Or, or within a range of that. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at this, you know, a, a six millimeter 108 at 2,900 foot per second, that's about standard, you know, for say a six Creed. Um, well, Mach 0 0.9 is 1,460 yards down range. Just muzzle velocity variation of 30 foot per second is worth 25 inches of vertical at that distance. So you're trying to make the claim that the reason you're hitting high or low is because your drag is off. But just within the velocity part of the contribution, muzzle velocity variation, you're dealing with 25 inches of vertical. Yeah. So did you catch a couple that went low? Were they due to velocity or drag? Don't know, right? Unless yeah. you measured it. And even if you back it in, you know, to some of the lower end limits that they'll let you adjust, at 1168, you're still dealing with yeah. 13 inches of vertical. Wow. Which would be still supersonic flight, which is, I'm sure, a lot of people that true their BCs do... Uh, uh, early mock value truing and a, and a lower mock value truing. Well, this one's trying to get you to true at Mach 0.9 would be the 1460. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is probably right around, you know, Mach 1.1 ish, yeah, right. somewhere in yeah. there. And why are they trying to get you to true way down there? Because that's where the problems are showing up from the solver standpoint, back to that other podcast, you know, where we, we, we beat that dead horse pretty good. Right. But if we go to an even more efficient bullet, let's say a 225 ELD match out of a 300 PRC. Yeah, baby. Here's that same 30 foot per second spread. Now you're dealing with 56 inches of vertical. It wants you to make that drag correction at 2,100 yards. Or it might let you do it at 1,680 yards. It's yeah. requiring you to do this at a mile and it won't accept anything inside of that. It'll be an invalid calibration. Yeah. You're dealing with 56 to 28 inches of vertical. That's just from velocity. That's not aiming error. That's not drag variability. That's not raw dispersion. All those things lump on. That number is conservative. It gets worse than that in reality. Yeah, that it's, is. It, it's not a good way to do it. That 30 cal vertical dispersion on target just based on 30 foot per second is quite nearly the height of my wife. Yeah, it's, in, <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. She's going to hit both of us when she hears yeah, that. Well, hey, five foot tall and proud. Yeah. Um, so the point there is that those problems that we went through in those prior podcasts at BC and where the errors lie and then where the errors show up from a prediction standpoint, they force you into using adjustment tools that are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. They're not effective. Um, and, and how many shooters out there have access to a 1,600-yard range yeah. or a 1,200-yard range? And even if you did, because everything's dependent on mock value and temperature, you're going to be it doing might this be again. A point. Yeah. 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 And we said there was a cost to all this, right? Every time you pull the trigger, it's money. Like how much, how much money are you going to spend using those programs just because of their, their inherent insufficiencies? Yep. So now let's talk about the Ford offside and what we did there that's different. So that axial form factor, I talked about that. That's the adjustment up or down within yep. a 10% limit there. We limit you. So you can't take it way out of context or way out of whack because we stop you. 
And if you hit that limit, there's a message that tells you, hey, you've reached the limit. Something else is wrong. Like it's literally impossible without like physically modifying this bullet, like taking side cutters and cutting the nose of the bullet off before you right. shoot it. It's literally impossible for this bullet to be this far out on drag. Yeah. Go check your inputs. And I, I mean, I've been in the field a lot, especially when, when teaching courses and stuff like this. And I mean, to the letter, every single time a guy comes up and he's like, hey, I was trying to do my axial form factor. And I went to the 10% limit and I need more. I tell him, follow the instructions. Go look at your inputs. He'll go back. Oh, I was in yards instead of meters. Oh. Or oh, dude, my muzzle velocity is not right. I don't know how that happened. You know, they fat fingered something yeah. when they typed something in or whatever it may be, but it keeps you out of trouble. It sure. makes you go back and find where the problem really yeah. lies. Well, in that 10%, very rarely do we ever see 10%. Right. I would and say, that- you know, probably north of 70% uh of the the bullets and barrels and guns and all that stuff out there should be between you know like probably plus or minus five to six percent that should yeah. be the meat and potatoes yep i agree 100 percent. I've, re- I've never had to to pull one out of point point five or five percent rather i've never i've never sat down trued something up and just been like okay i'm i'm really confident in this axial form factor correction and it had to be more than five percent yeah yeah so we're talking percentages here for the listener or those that have that have used the app uh, when you look at the axial form factor numbers, 1.0 is the average, and then it goes 1.1, 1. 1, 1. 1.2, all mm-hmm. the way up to 1.1, 1. 1, which yeah. is 10%, and then back down to, to 0. 0.9. So what we're saying is that between point, 70% of the circumstances out there should live between a, an axial form factor of 0. 0.95 and 1.05. Right. Uh, if you're outside of those limits, it's possible, but it's, it's pretty, pretty rare. Yeah. And then another point that you've been mentioning, you might hit this uh, here in just a minute, is that it's in percentages because it moves the entire drag curve one percent at a time. Yep. Whereas when you're trying to to true a BC, you're trying to put a bend in the curve, and you can't bend the can't curve. Bend you can it. only shift it. Yep. Uh, and so you're trying to shift it at one in you know arbitrary distance, uh, and then shift it again at a different arbitrary distance, and you can't put a knee in the curve. Right. You can't put an elbow in there. It's right. got to shift the whole thing up and down, and uh, that's important to note why. You know, some people have reached out to me very familiar with using BC based uh, calculators. Ah, why can't I true at two different velocities? Right. You don't need to. No, because the real curve is in there. Yeah, you, the you, real you, curve. You don't deal with the mismatch in curve shape between a G1 or a G7 standard and your actual bullet because the G1 and G7 standard are gone. Your bullet is now the standard bullet. Exactly. So you don't have to deal with that anymore. Perfect. Okay, so with that axial form factor, we recommend. Uh, that you you conduct your axial form factor um, calibration or, or whatever you want to call it uh, between time of flights of 0.5 and 1.3 seconds. And the reason why we say time of flight is because that's the actual value that matters, right? It's all based on time. Now, we usually think of things in, in distance as shooters, right? Yeah. Not so much time. Um, so that would be, you know, generally between like four to 800 yards, uh, generally speaking there, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on the specifics of what you're shooting. Um but more accurately, between time of flights of 0.5 and 1.3 is where you should conduct that. However, we don't limit you to that. You can conduct beyond yeah. or if, inside of that. If this is, yeah, if you're, yeah, getting ready and you show up for an event and you've got a 300 yard range, well, do your best to shoot your smallest yeah. group and isolate all the variables and do it at 300. But yeah. like you mentioned, time of flight takes out the, I mentioned, you know, truing a BC, I mentioned arbitrary distances because mm-hmm. those distances are arbitrary based on your environment uh, and what bullet you're shooting, right? Um, the distance is inconsequential. It is just a corollary of the time of flight in that environment with that bullet. That's right. That's right. So yeah, there's the layman's rule, you know, generally about four to 800. And, and all of this is in the app. Like, don't think you have to take notes and record all this stuff. Right. It, it, Although it's you in should. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we compare that method to what we were looking at over here with, with kind of this ridiculousness going on, um, you know, if we're looking at 0.5 to 1.3 seconds with that same six Creedmoor, you're going to be uh, doing a, an axial form factor between 420 yards and 920 yards. Well, at 420 yards, that 30 foot per second of velocity spread, same thing we were comparing on the other one, is worth one inch of vertical. It's nothing. Yeah. Right? In comparison to 25 inches of vertical or 13 inches of vertical. Even if you go all the way out to 920, kind of the, the upper limit at uh, 1.3 second time of flight, that's six inches of vertical just coming from velocity. So it's a much tighter window. Sure. Right? So what, what I'm saying there is that your, your 
your group sizes on target are going to be tighter, and therefore you can make a more accurate assessment if you are hitting low or you are hitting high. You're making a more accurate determination than if you're shooting a 56 inch shotgun pattern and you're only going to shoot five shots. Well, you randomly picked five out of a, a giant window yeah. and then said that that was your drag. It's not a good way to do no. it. Well, and there is a chance that you, you know, let's say you're doing with that 30 cal example at 2,100 yards, there's a chance you stack a group up 12, 15 inches on a five shot group at 2,100 yards. That's possible because you're just randomly picking this huge distribution of shot dispersion. And yeah, there's a chance yeah. that you've got a 56 inch window just on velocity spread. And of the, you know, the possibilities, you just happen to land those in there. It has nothing to do with the drag of the bullet right. or, or calling or calibrating or truing BC at all. It just was luck of the draw. Right. Right. And, and any of the listeners out there that are savvy with statistics probably know that until your sample size gets to 30 or more, you're really not making any sort of valid metrics on, on what is real or not, right? You're kind of just floating in the noise up to that point. So those shooters that do go out with a BC system and only shoot a couple of shots and then make some grandiose determination that it is the drag that's wrong, independent of all the other things that influence where a bullet goes, eh, you're, not, you're not really on solid ground. Right. But, when, but when you use the Fordoff method, since it, has, uh, since it has the real drag curve in it, you're no longer dealing with all the problems associated there. And all you're doing is making a very small little tweak. And it's, it's a much better way to do it. So <clears throat> if we, you know, we were just talking about velocity there. Let's look at kind of a, an all things considered approach. So a 25 per, foot per second of uh, muzzle velocity variation, drag variation at 2%, crosswind and headwind uncertainty of 1%, a cant error of one degree, an aiming error of a quarter minute. I would say those are all pretty. Cons- pretty real life. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the. Um, conservative side it easily can be worse than that especially mm-hmm. on the wind um, but we look at those things and we're we're getting a picture that looks like this you know with that six creed uh 420 to 920 would be that distance range that we would be recommended to do our axial form factor in well you're shooting groups that look like this yeah just tight everything's right in there where you'd expect it to be with that normal you know kind of round shot dispersion yep and so your ability to say yeah that that patterning is three inches high is much more accurate when you're shooting stuff like this than if you're, you know, and this, this graph is a 20 inch you know, or a 40 inch square, right? 20 inches, either direction from center. Remember that, remember the, the 56 inch deal, your, your, your group is going to be bigger than that just because of velocity, right? Let alone the muzzle velocity, or excuse me, the, the drag variation, the crosswind estimation, the aiming air. Right. And here's the, here's the extreme ends of that. There's 1100 and 1400 showing you that with that other system, right? That's what was, was being required about with that, with that six creed, totally different. Yeah. I mean, the, the five random shots that you do here are going to be totally different than the five random shots you do here. You could easily uh, have a bunch of noise in here and especially here, right? If you yeah. did five shots of that and made a determination on if you were high or low versus these five random ones, this is just not going to be as accurate. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you want to up your sample size on this to 30, now you're talking, now you're making a, a significant uh, measurement of if you are actually off or not. Again, it goes back to cost. Are you willing to use the BC based program with its issues that it has that requires you to shoot a really high sample size to be valid or use a better system yeah that's free that doesn't require that to be right well and nobody wants to lay down and shoot 30 shots at 1400 yards when you know yeah what are you gonna what are you gonna shoot a 14 inch group and a a minute of angle group at 1400 yards are you kidding me like nobody's laying down and and shooting groups like that in uh the hefty majority of users right to to be able to make an assessment on if they should true their bc or not yeah yeah just to yeah, exactly just to make the assessment should i adjust a number in my program or yeah not, not gonna yeah, happen good, good point okay this one uh th- this one might be difficult to do in just the audio format we'll see what happens but what we're looking at here is how how the bc based program versus ford off handles zero zero range and, and the method for that so First, we need to define what zero range is. We're all pretty familiar with it, right? Right. So, uh, input we've all used. So zero range as a definition is uh, the distance at which the bullet crosses the line of sight, right? So with that definition, um, we can start to see that it's really 
a, a zero range can really be valid for only one set of conditions. Because when uh, wind starts to pick up, aerodynamic jump starts to yeah. show up. Which is tangible at 100 yards, where a lot of people like to zero their rifles. Right. It is, a, it is measurable. Right. Um, large temperature pressure changes will influence, especially if you're zeroing at longer distances. Right. Um, angle fire, obviously, is going to contribute to it. So in a nutshell, what we have here is a group on the left-hand side where we have a point of aim marker and about an inch and an eighth high is a very nice shot cluster. It's perfectly centered left to right. Um, and then we have to the right of that an image of essentially a very similar target. But what we see is a similar group size that has now been shifted a half inch right. That's because we had a left to right crosswind. Mm -hmm. And it's come down. The average of that is down about one inch high instead of that inch and eighth inch and a quarter high mm -hmm. those those groups were fired with the same load out of the same gun in two different wind conditions on the same range at the same range so the question is here the bullet was crossing the line of sight an inch and an eighth to an inch and a quarter high at 100 here the bullet is crossing the line of sight one inch high at 100 do those have the same zero range Obviously not. By the definition up here, obviously not. The zero range is the point at which the bullet crosses the line of sight. It is crossing the line of sight at different points. That's simply because of wind. So your zero range is good, but not good enough. Zero range is very simple, kind of like how BC mathematically and computational power-wise is pretty simple right. compared to Fordoff, is the same thing we're about to get into next. So zero range is... It's changeable, right? Yeah. It can move around on you. It's arbitrary. You know, it's arbitrary. Based on the conditions you're in. And it's, it's one of those deals, like you've been saying this whole study, it's a very small difference. Okay, so your zero range, let's say, was 200 yards and now it's 190 yards. Mm -hmm. But you're starting your calculator off 10 yards off when well, you're trying to shoot stuff far away. Yeah, and you think about it from a range standpoint and being off on your zero range by 10 yards doesn't seem that consequential. However... What you have to look at is what the difference is in the trajectory at that point. So uh, let's say that your, your zero is, is off by a quarter inch at 100 because of, of this, right? Your, your zero range is varying due to the conditions, and it, the impact that you see of that at 100 yards is a quarter inch difference. That quarter inch error is magnified in a linear way. So at 1,000, that becomes a two and a half inch error. Is two and a half inch error important at 1,000? Can be. Absolutely. We yeah. looked at those other podcasts, you know, where we, we looked at how that artificially shifts the group up or down by that amount. Yeah. Yes, that's going to affect your hit probability. Absolutely. Are you still going to hit the target? Absolutely, you will. Are you Sometimes, going to hit yeah. it as many times as you would if you weren't dealing with that error? No, absolutely not. Right. And so some folks will get lost in the fact that they've said, well, I've used zero range my whole life. I'm using zero range today, and I've never had a problem with it. The question is, have you had a problem that you've measured or perceived with it? Some shooters out there will have experienced a large enough shift in the zero range to say, yes, it's a problem, right? right. Some people won't. They'll say, well, I still hit the target even though they hit it low. But if they would have laid down and shot a significant number of shots in both conditions, they would see, I'm not hitting as often with this one as I am with this one. Mm -hmm. So about for, if you want to up your first shot hit consistency at long range, at extended ranges, ELR type ranges, if you want to up your first shot consistency, or all, all of your impacts, but for sure, if you're trying to put that first round on target every single time you get behind the gun and you're running zero range, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yes. Yeah. And so in the Fordoff program, we offer zero range because sure. it's so established. Everybody understands how to, you know, go determine their zero range, you know, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. It's in there, but it's not the recommended way to go about it. The, rec the recommended method is what's called zero angle. And in, in the app, especially in, in the Kestrel, and the website, there's a toggle that you can click to change from zero range to zero angle. Now, what is zero angle? The zero angle calculates all the trajectories based off the launch angle of the barrel, which is how it actually works. Right. right? The bullet's exiting the barrel and the barrel's pointed at an angle. Yeah. With, with that said, leads us into a little bit of explanation on how zero range is handled in the ballistics calculator that uses it. When you tell a program a zero range, let's say I'm zeroed at 100 yards. That program doesn't know anything else. It only knows what you tell it. So it's going to make the bullet cross the line of sight at 100. Let's, let's blow that example up to something that might make it easier to see. 
let's say you zeroed a gun at a thousand yards. Okay. No difference between a hundred and a thousand yards zero, right? Your scope is set to zero. You aim at the target at that distance and you hit that target in the center. That's, that's being zeroed. Let's say that we say we did that on, you know, the coast of Alaska. So we're down at sea level yep. and it's 20 degrees out. It's a cold day. We zero that gun at a thousand. We slip the turret on our scope to zero. It's a really good shooting gun. We take that gun and that ammunition. The, let's say the ammunition has no temperature sensitivity, so the velocity will not change due to ambient air temperature. Okay. We take that system, and in the middle of the summer, we go to a mountaintop in Colorado or Wyoming, and we're, we're at uh, 80, 90 degrees out at eight or 9,000 feet of altitude. Totally different air densities, right? Incredibly totally different. Totally different Mach numbers, right? Yep. If we shot that rifle at 1,000 yards without adjusting anything, would we hit the center of the target? Certainly Obviously not, no. right? Obviously no. That's an extreme example that proves to you that zero range isn't how it works because the program only knows what you told it. You told it you were zeroed at a thousand yards. It says, okay, I, I don't know anything else. You told me that's the truth. I'm going to make that show up as the truth. And it shows you holding zero at 1000, mm -hmm. but you shoot that target and you miss. So obviously zero range isn't how it works. Right. How it works is a bullet goes where it goes because it was launched at a certain angle, going a certain speed with certain drag characteristics through a certain environment. That's why it ends up going where it goes. Yep. So what we did with zero angle was, was develop an ability to calculate the solutions based off the launch angle, which is how it actually works. So that means it's valid for any set of conditions because now the program isn't starting calculations, say, beyond the zero range, right? It ignores everything you tell it and makes the bullet cross the line of sight at that range. It right. doesn't say that anymore. When you use zero angle, the program says, okay, well, you've told me the conditions. You told me which bullet you're shooting because you picked it out of the library. And that bullet has these drag and, and um, dynamic characteristics to it. You told me the velocity that it's going. You described to me what the winds are doing, right? These are all inputs you put in the program. And what the program says when running zero angle, it says, okay, well, this is the launch angle. Therefore, the bullet's going to go here. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you determine what that angle is? Well, you can't throw a protractor up on your barrel or, or a you know gunner's quadrant or anything yeah. like that. The, the angle is extremely the old finite. sloped dope. Yeah, the old <laughs> sloped over. Yeah, that's that's not a good way to do it. So what we do, um, is we is we physically shoot it, and we tell the program everything that happens. So just like you're familiar with zeroing a rifle, say you go to lay down at 100 yards, you shoot a group, you make any adjustments to your scope that you may want to do, or or not want to do, whatever you want to do, and you shoot a group to confirm and you're zeroed, right? That's kind of the general process that we go through. With the, the process of finding your zero angle is the exact same thing, but you just record what the conditions were like. Okay. So when you go into the program, you tell it, this is my velocity. Most circumstances, it already pulls that over if you already had the file built. Um, here's my velocity. Here's the bullet and its drag and dynamic characteristics. Here's the environmentals of when I was zeroing, temp, pressure, humidity, altitude. Here's the wind conditions when I shot my zero group, if there's wind present. Because sometimes when you go to zero, it's windy and you got no choice, right? Right. It would be optimum to zero in a no wind situation. Sometimes you don't have that. Almost never. <laughs> Almost never in Nebraska anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, you, so you tell it what the winds were. Big, small, doesn't matter. Tell it what they were. And then you tell it where you hit from an elevation. You know, I hit a half inch high or I hit dead on or I hit three inches low. Just tell it what happened. And, you know, if you hit three inches low and you want to adjust that up so you're closer to zero, Go for it. Doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter. And then just shoot another group afterwards and use that group to put in. Yeah, the program doesn't care where you hit. It just needs to know where you hit. And what it then says, and your site height's a big part of that in putting that. Um, what the program then does is it it executes a bunch of trajectories and finds which one matches. It says, okay, with this site height, with this bullet, with this environment, all that stuff I explained. The only way that the bullet could hit a half inch high at that distance is if the launch angle of the barrel was X when you fired and it records that angle you records that angle so now you found that angle once you find that angle you technically don't have to re-zero your gun no matter where you go or what conditions you shoot in as long as the mechanical relationship is maintained between your optic your, which is your line of sight right that's the tool you're using to generate that as long as the relationship is maintained between the optic and the barrel which obviously those are tied together by the receiver and the scope base and the scope rings mechanically those things don't change your zero angle never changes wow now that's what remarkable you, what you will see change is what the program tells you is going to happen so when we 
oh, we do this same Alaska example, right? We zero angle it at a thousand yards, but you can do that mm -hmm. um, in Alaska. And uh, it says, okay, well, the launch angle for that is, you know, 0. Uh, 0.7325 degrees. Okay. That's the angle of the barrel required in these conditions with that bullet for it to hit dead on at a thousand. We pack that system up. We go to that mountaintop in Colorado or Wyoming. We lay down to shoot. We plug in the environmental conditions in Wyoming. And it says, you're going to hit, you know, 0.4 mils high. Well, how does it, it's not saying that we're hitting dead on again. Right. Why is it different? Because what it's doing is it's saying, this is the angle, that 0.07, whatever number I just said for the zero angle. It's saying, well, we're starting with that launch angle. Which hasn't changed. The has, physical relationship is identical. Exactly. It hasn't changed. Uh, the environmentals have changed. You've updated those. So now I'm using those updated ones. And it launches the bullet and says, okay, well, in these conditions at that launch angle, you're going to hit this much high. At that range. And yeah. what would happen if you did that? You would hit that much high because that's how it actually works. Wow. So to give you a visual of it, that zero angle is the angular relationship between your line of sight mm -hmm. and the launch angle of the barrel. Beautiful. That right there is such a, uh, an important thing, I think, in, in the, the modern rifleman out there shooting matches uh, going on hunts and, you know, doing some traveling and you, and you have a system and now primers are hard to find, you know, bullets aren't cheap, powder, certainly not cheap and getting more expensive and hard to find. Uh, you, you have all this cost associated with it. You can zero your rifle, do it really well, like as well as you can possibly do it. And you do it one time mm -hmm. and you don't have to go, yeah, you should go to a match and you should, you know, run your rifle out, you know, the day before the match, just to make sure everything's good and nothing came loose or whatever, but you don't have to spend time chasing your zero true in your BC again. You can do it once, do it right the first time. And you're done. And you're done. And you can go anywhere in the world yep. with that same, you know, rifle ammo combination and be good to go. Yeah. That's awesome. And in the competitive world, you know, you and I, have sh you show up to a match and you show up the day before to register and typically there's a range to, ch you know, zero on or whatever. What percentage of the guys show up and are just banging off rounds? Almost all of them. Almost all of them. Yep. And every time there's a cost associated with that, right? Yep. I, I haven't re-zeroed my one match rifle in years. I show up to matches and I don't check zero. I don't check anything. Maybe if I, you know, am concerned it got bumped or something physically, yeah, yeah. I'll check it. But if not, why waste the time and money? Like, yeah. And if you're not... If you don't trust that, you're not confident in that, go try it a couple times. And after yeah. a couple times, when it does exactly, when it tells you exactly what ends up happening when you shoot the group, yep, you can start saving money from then on out. Yeah. Well, and, and I find it very useful just for my, for my mental space, show up at a match, take a shot at a moderate distance, three, 400 yards, take a shot at a longer distance, maybe 800 to 900 yards if I can. Mm -hmm. if they have anything past a thousand, take a shot at that as well. And I'll usually shoot anywhere from three to 10 rounds. Mm -hmm. And it just gives me that warm and fuzzy feeling. There has been one instance where uh, I did have a scope base come loose mm -hmm. and it showed it, itself. Yeah. So it's like, well, that was, thank God I did that. Yep. Um, but other than that, you're not seeing typically, like you'd mentioned, you see people shoot five to 10 rounds at a hundred yards mm -hmm. and then three to five rounds at five different distances. And that's, pretty conservative that lets a lot of people doing that and then there's the extreme cases where people are out there just making it rain mm -hmm. uh, and they're out there for several hours yeah. just yeah playing around well especially the guy that shows up and shoots and his his zero isn't zeroed anymore and nothing happened it didn't get touched you know maybe it's just the wind conditions from when he zeroed before to what it is at the you know match yeah. prep that day and he's freaking out because you only get 20 minutes you know you got to allow other shooters to come in and yeah. shoot and he's freaking out and he's adjusting stuff and he's all messed up before he even yeah. starts the match it's it's, it's not fun to watch no it's not a, you feel for those guys and yeah zero angle just one of those things that not everybody that uses ford off uses zero angle and i understand that because it is such an ingrained way to do things using zero range mm -hmm. but i'll tell you what take the time learn it apply it use it and one, with ford off you can clone your profile and yeah. make two duplicate profiles well, just turn one into zero angle. If you don't, if you're, if you're a little leery, just try it. Yep. And yeah, when you go somewhere else or you have a major different wind condition, open it up and see what it says. And it's pretty remarkable because it'll tell you at a hundred yards, you know, that it, it will be, yeah, 0 0.05 mils different or one, you know, tenth of a mil or two tenths of a mil, whatever it is. Right. It'll calculate that. 
and it'll open your eyes. And when you lay down and you shoot, if you want to test it, you lay down and shoot and you say, well, I'm two tenths of a mil high. And you look at it and it says, yeah, you'll be two tenths of a mil high. You then have confidence that this thing is spitting out what's happening yeah, in reality. Exactly. Yeah. So that part's pretty cool. That's one of my favorite parts of it. That thing has saved me so much trouble after, yeah. after we implemented that. It's great. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff within the app. So in the Fordoff app, we have the the bullet the Fordoff bullet library. We explained a little bit of that. So that has our entire line of Botil Hollow Point, ELD Match, ELDX, and A-Tip bullets. CX bullets. And CX, yeah. I got to get this updated, don't I? Yeah. Um, so why is there not a VMAX in there? SST. An SST. Because those bullets are designed for traditional ranges, traditional range use where BC calculation is sufficient, right? Generally, those bullets are used inside of time of flights of a half of a second. Mm -hmm. BC is fine for that kind of stuff, right? We saw that when we went through those podcasts where the error inside of 500, no matter how bad it was beyond that, wasn't that much inside of 500. Right. And that's why. Um, from a competitor bullet standpoint, you'll see that there's all kinds of bullets from Sierra, Berger, Nosler, uh, Lapua, Werner Tool, a bunch of 22 long rifles are in there for you know those yeah. circuits that are getting very popular. Oh, yeah. Um, we're adding bullets in all the time. Vapor trail. Um, vapor, vapor trail. Vapor trails bullet. in there. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a bunch of different stuff in there. I mean, this this hasn't been updated in a while. But some users will ask, and I think it was a, a comment I saw on one of the prior YouTube uh, podcasts, was, you know, why aren't uh, certain bullets in there from other manufacturers? Sometimes we can't put a bullet in Ford off if it suffers from, say, the tip deformation problem yeah. that was solved with heat shield tip. Yeah, so, aerodynamic heating. Right. And and I don't want to call out names, but there are other bullet companies out there that make tipped bullets and those tipped bullets still suffer from aerodynamic heating. So I can't I can't put a good drag curve in Ford off for you to use because it the the shape of the curve of the drag curve depends on how fast you're shooting it, what your velocity is, and what the ambient air temperature is. And if you shoot those at different conditions, different temperatures, or different velocities, the drag curve shape changes because the amount of tip deformation changes. Yeah. And so I can't put those in Fordoff because I don't know how you're going to use it. Yeah. And so that's why you'll see some of those bullets will never be in Fordoff because they're not they're not applicable for it. You, right. You, you have to use BC for those. Yep. And there, there's better bullets out there. If that's if you're in the business of shooting stuff far away. Yeah. You know, there's bullets out there that have tips. Right. That yeah. Don't try, deform. try a bullet with a heat shield tip. Yep. That problem goes away. Um, so yeah, there's 150 bullets in that library. It's always growing 150. That's an old number too. I think we're North at 200 now. Yeah. But it's, the library is composed of bullets that are intended to be used for long range, right? Uh, if it's, if it's general range stuff, that's what BC side is for. Yeah. And it's in, been pretty awesome to see. I know early in the podcast, uh, the ballistic study, we had Jacob Morrow on mm -hmm. and Jacob with his background in Doppler radar, uh, and then having him assist you in the lab. Uh, he's able to get bullets in Ford off a lot more uh, quick than, you know, in years past uh, mm -hmm. where you're inundated with 8 million projects. And yeah. it was, we tried to do it as best we could, but, you know, sometimes you just run into time constraints and we, you know, it's not like people are tripping over themselves to send us their bullets. You know, yeah. these are, we're going out and purchasing competitor bullets right. and we're shooting the, them through our rifles. We're at the mercy of the market, you know, which yeah. has been tough the last couple of years. So yeah. We, we have done that where if you have a bullet that's not one of ours, but you'd like it added into Ford off, uh, get a hold of us. You know, if, yeah. if, if you'd be willing to send us a, a sample of those bullets, we'll add them to Ford off. I mean, we're not, we, we would like to grow that library as much as possible, but again, we're limited on our ability to, to find and get bullets to yeah. test. So, um, so also within that app, you know, we've really been concentrating on, on Ford off and why it's different and all that, but within the Hornady app itself, we have a BC calculator in there as well. Sure. Because again, there's times for it, right? If mm -hmm. it's if it's time of flight's a 0.5 or less, those, you know, out to four or 500 yards, the, the BC calculators are fine. Um, every bullet that we offer at Hornady is in that BC library. And uh, some of them, all, well, all of them have a G1 and some of them have a G7 if you, if you want to use those. Okay. Um, there's also something really cool, which is the ammo library. So every... Every ammo skew that we make um, is in that ammo library. So if you're a, a brand new shooter to using a ballistics calculator or shooting at distance or whatever, and you, you don't have a chronograph, you're starting from scratch. Um, if you go into the ammo library and you pick one of those skews of ammo, it will preload the velocity out of a test barrel with that, which yeah. is better than nothing. Sure. Um, 
and also the drag information, right? The BC information for that. So essentially in one click, you can get half of the inputs done yeah. that you need. So it's really nice for an entry level use. Yeah. If you're going out there and you're shooting prey dogs or shooting coyotes, or you get somewhere and, and whatever reason you have to get a gun and ammo combination that, you know, you didn't plan on running. Mm -hmm. This is not the perfect way to do it, but gosh, it makes it quick. It makes it simple. And for traditional range and shooting, it's going to be, you know, good enough as we've been saying. That's right. So if we kind of go back to that basic issue that we started those early podcasts with is we need to we need to know how fast the thing slows down, right? Without that very detailed information, we can't predict how much come up you're going to need, how much hold off you're going to need for wind and spin drift and all those things. Um, the BC based methods, uh, they used a coefficient based estimate of the drag, right? We're estimating, we know the drag at one particular point and we're estimating everything else. A um, lot of room on the table for error. Yeah. With Ford off you have the CD measured drag, right? We, we have that exact drag curve in, in the program. For spin drift and aerodynamic jump and all those other dynamic calculations, BC has to use that rule of thumb empirical formula, which leaves, leaves a lot to be desired on, on how accurate that yeah. thing is calculated. Accurate with some, probably good. Accuracy with others, probably horrible. Yeah. And it's just going to span that whole gamut. And there's no way for you to know until you try it and realize that it's good or bad. You right. Know? Um, with Ford off, we're doing, we're doing coefficient tables, uh, that come from that spark range derived, derived data. And that's way better, right? We're actually executing those equations to calculate what's going to happen instead mm -hmm. of using some, you know, formula that was generated on some other bullet over here and ours is completely different. It's kind of back to that same BC based problem. Yeah. So, um, I think that pretty well, pretty well sums that up. I mean, in back to the, back to the beginning, we, we saw the problems with BC. We suffered from them ourselves. We finally got the tools uh, almost 10 years ago now to go a better way. Yeah. And we went a better way and it's free. Um, and we'd like you to try it if you don't, if you haven't used it before. You yeah. Know, if, if you don't, hey, some things aren't for everybody. If you don't like it and you want to go back to the system you're using before and it works for you, cool. You know, all the, all the stuff we've talked about so far about, hey, here's a problem, here's a problem, here's a problem. You know, if you live in that program with those problems and you're able to make it work, great, good, good for you. We're not trying to get anything out of yeah. you. We're just saying, hey, we took the time and did this and it's better for these specific reasons that we laid out and uh, give it a shot. Yeah, give it a shot. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. If your time is worth things to you, I mean, that in and of itself, we've been talking about the cost associated with chasing your tail using you know, the BC based stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you, again, you see people just buried in their Kestrel getting after it uh, week after week after week as they go to these matches and as they go, go on these hunts and shoots and stuff. If, if the, the cost is one thing, but if your time is valuable enough that you don't want to keep doing that, mm -hmm. yeah, strongly consider running for it off, looking at the, you know, we talked about zero angle. That's one of those time saving features. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody likes to chase their tail. And your time is also worth something. Yeah. Uh, it just makes it a better mousetrap all the way around. Yeah. And and if you have your system that you've been using and you're confident in it, just pull Ford off up on the side and see what it says as you shoot in different environments. And if you start yeah. to see problems with the system you've been using, you know, you're hitting a little higher, you're hitting a little lower, your wind calcs are off, go see what Ford off says. Is it better than what you're currently using? You know, it, it doesn't yeah. cost you nothing to do it. Um, yeah. And availability so it's it's in the hornady app right yeah. which is ios and android yep uh there are some paid features in it there's a couple little advanced features that you can buy for like a dollar or a couple dollars or whatever um but you know 95 percent of the app that you're going to use is free yeah it's just the advanced features that are that are a cost um and and to be to be clear the advanced features very very small use case i would consider myself i you know, obviously consider you a, a rather advanced user and I've used this stuff all over the country. I've used it in other countries. Those advanced features, I've, I almost never use. Yeah, they're uh, kind of tailored for like competition. Yeah, when or, I'm at a PRS match, yeah. yeah, I use the range card feature. Uh, but past that, and not the range card. Was it called? Uh, is it uh, range? Mul card? Well, there's multi HUD yeah. and, and range card. Yeah, the multi HUD and the range card. You can you can do a basic range card, it free in free, the app. Yeah, but mm -hmm. the only time I've ever used either of those features is at a PRS match. Yeah, uh, outside of that. Again, having being what I'd consider an advanced user, just the free downloadable app has been, yeah, that's, that's, that's my workhorse. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so it's available there. It's also available in the Kestrel. Like mm-hmm. you said, some guys love the Kestrel. It's an awesome device. I mean, it's... it's uh, well, it's certainly tough. It's tough. The battery lasts a long time. You're mm-hmm. getting all your environmental measurements on it. So it certainly has its place, especially Absolutely. in the field environments where, yep. you know, you might not want to expose your phone to inclement weather or the battery yeah. dies when it's cold or whatever, you know. Yep. Um, and then it's also available on our website. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the other cool things about the phone app is that uh, there's a there's a login page where you can create an account, essentially. Yeah. And the purpose for that is that everything that you then do in the app and save in there, like a favorite gun profile or or a, or a result you saved or whatever, that gets saved to the to the cloud to your account. And so if you get a new phone, or let's say you're on the range and your phone breaks, right? Like something yeah. falls on it and it smashes the thing. You can log in on your buddy's phone and all that stuff comes there. Yeah. Or you can do multiple devices. Like uh, say you're an instructor and you, you implement tablets or whatever. Oh, yeah. You can have uh, like a house account. You know, you create up an email, uh, just a generic email for your school or whatever. Say you have school rifles. You have 10 different rifles that the students are going to use. Yep. You can have 10 tablets, 10 rifles, and you just log in under there and boom, everything right there, comes to right that there. one. It's really cool. It's like that a is, universal application. Yep, that's awesome. And and a quick point on the, the Kestrel, because I've been asked this question uh, before. A lot of folks that are uh, dyed-in-the-wool Kestrel users uh, going from a BC-based ke- uh, Kestrel to the Fordoff Kestrel, well, a BC Kestrel, I can have 25 profiles in here. Mm-hmm. How come I can only have three? Good point. With yeah. Fordoff. And yeah, elaborate on that. It's obviously a pretty simple answer, answer but... Um, like to hear your official answer. Yeah, the 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 Fordoff calculations are so complex and heavy mathematically, in combination with the size of that bullet file. Remember, four hundred and thirty seven values per bullet versus three. Mm-hmm. Um, that that it's simply a storage problem, right? Yeah. So that that thing is so complex and takes up so much room on that device that yeah, you're limited to the amount of guns that you can have on it compared to the BC based ones. Yep. So I just wanted to to hear that out of your mouth, and I put it that same way that. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can have 25 or what, however many profiles. Cool. Yeah, you can only have three. And all of that space between your three profiles in Fordoff and the 20 whatever mm-hmm. in the BC side is computational power and accuracy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a great unit for what it is. Um, but, it, yeah, it can only hold so much. Yeah. And the under-the-hood performance of Fordoff takes up some space. Yeah. And and it's easy to get around that. You know, are you ever going to use more than, you know, say three guns in the field at a time? Probably not. You can store as many gun pro- profiles as you want on the Kestrel app. Mm-hmm. So and then depending on what you're going out with, using. yeah, just Bluetooth it and push those ones over. Yep. Pretty Simple. easy. Awesome. Well, this has been another, another great one. And I'm glad, you know, this kind of culminated the, uh, the whole ballistic study up to this one. And I think, uh, you know, it's a busy time of year. It's the fall, it's hunting season. We're getting into the holidays. Uh, so I can't promise the listener when this will happen, but I'd like to get you uh, in another Quinlan's corner. Oh boy! And this installment would be <laughs> maybe a an advanced Ford off class. Yeah, uh, for sure. To we walk through some of the advanced features. Well, maybe we should do two. Maybe we should do a beginning Ford off where get on the screen so that the the YouTubers can watch this. Mm-hmm. Here's how you set up a profile, and here's how you set up a profile correctly. Mm-hmm. You only have to do it once. And then maybe get into some more advanced features and some of those competition-specific type paid features mm-hmm. uh, that we were talking about. That'd be really, really helpful because it can be intimidating to go from strump, you know, something a, a, a free BC-based download on your phone, mm-hmm. about as easy as it gets. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's super simple. Um, and then you download Ford off and it's asking me for all these things. Uh, it can be overwhelming. And so I think it'd be good to update um, you know, there's a YouTube video of me several years ago right. walking through that. Well, there's been some changes uh, to the app since then. So yeah. uh, I think uh, in the next few installments of your uh, of Quinlan's Corner, maybe we should. Uh, I, I wince every time you say yeah, that. Yeah, I wince too. We should probably, <laughs> I can't get over it though. I can't stop saying it now that I've said it. Yeah, it's established, I guess. I guess. Well, Jaden, uh, we've got uh, Thanksgiving coming up. I hope you guys, you and your family have a great Thanksgiving. Hope everybody out there in podcast land has a great Thanksgiving. And Jaden, thank you for coming on the show and, and sharing this with us. Hey, my pleasure. Awesome. Everybody out there, this is one for the books. Take some notes. Listen to this as many times as you want to and give Ford off a try. We'd sure appreciate it. If you have questions, comments, recommendations, as always, send them over to podcast at hornady.com or drop a comment in this video and we'll get back to you as soon as we can and we'll catch you on the next one.